Well, I'm not talking about chili mac. If it has noodles, it's no longer chili. That's chili mac. I mean, I can eat it, but it's not chili. I, my wife won't let me have Fritos anymore, but I make a chili that will absolutely bring you into another level of glory. It is absolutely beautiful. How many chili mac eaters do we have? You have to put noodles in there and run your chili. Okay. How many people you have beans? How many no beans? Okay. All right. All right. My wife, instead of tomato juice, uses V8, spicy V8. Yeah. It kicks it up a notch in a good way. It's good stuff. What about bacon? Now, it's not even a debate. How many people eat it right? You eat it flabby. How many people eat it burnt? Here's the truth. If you hold a piece of bacon out and it stays straight, you're holding a burnt piece of bacon. <laughs> We have what we consider to be manners, especially while eating. And when someone violates our way, we get bothered and offended and put off. For instance, when I eat popcorn, I eat it where no one else hears that I'm eating popcorn. Hallelujah. And now at Cinemark, you have to choose your seat before you go in, and you have no clue if you're going to eat next to the rudest person in the world. They're like, Tuck. and it's like, and I ask them, like, I don't want to choose my seat. I want to go in there and not sit around anybody else. And they said, sir, if we find you in a seat that's not been assigned to you, you will be asked to leave the theater. I'm like, what about the people that don't know how to eat? We don't eat with elbows on the table. We eat slowly. Don't eat with your hands. We use utensils. Use napkins on your lap. Eat quietly. We pass around the food before anybody starts eating. Later on that. We say please and thank you. And you have an order in which you eat the meal. Appetizer first. Salad. Main course. Dessert, maybe some coffee with the dessert. And you, what would happen if you walk in into the restaurant and you know you order your in, entree and the people around you are eating steak and you said, "Oh, I want the dessert first. I'll have my uh, chocolate paradise while they're eating their steak, and then I'll have my steak." While we would look at them like, "What is wrong with you? That's not the way you do that." <laughs> if something's dropped on the floor, don't give me this five-second rule nonsense. It does not exist. Don't you have any knowledge of the germ theory of disease whatsoever? But honestly, it's a preference that we've made rules about. We hosted an exchange student a few years ago, and we love him. But every time we ate, he smacked his mouth and he slurped his noodles. Slightly. Like I'm sitting there and I can feel my blood pressure rising. <laughs> it drove me nuts, but I didn't want to be rude. Finally, one day at the table, I, like I used last week, that's all I could stand and I can't stand some more. And I waited too long. I had that moment that you should deal with it the first time and don't let it just fester. He was doing the noodle thing. <laughs> And I just looked up and I said, Enough! Would you please close your mouth? You're driving me nuts! He looked at me in shock. And he told me, In my culture, it's a compliment to eat that way because it means that the meal is being enjoyed. What was irritating me was him giving the highest praise. Interesting. If someone eats a second helping and piles their plate up, we look at them thinking, you disgusting pig. <laughs> Go ahead, fatty, get you another plate. 
But in some places, unless you eat a second plate, it is rude because it means that you did not enjoy the meal. What about belching at the table? That's a good way to get dismissed from the table and spanked when I was a kid. You eat, you're just... Sorry for that. But you know, in a lot of places, that's the highest compliment you can give a chef. Because it means that you thoroughly enjoyed the meal and it was satisfying to you. What about the people that give these nonverbal sounds while they eat? Like, mmm. And I'm just looking at them like, what is wrong with you? But to a cook, it's music in their ears. One thing that I do, and I, I believe this is the correct way to eat, I don't like my food to touch on a plate. This is not a party. It's not a, a fraternity party. I don't let my food fraternize. I eat one thing at a time, and when I'm done with my green beans, I'll move on to my mashed, mashed cauliflower now. And then I'll eat that, and then I'll eat this. Some people, you ever see them, they come in and all of a sudden, like they're stirring creamer in a coffee, they just mix their food up, you know? <laughs> Why? To them, that's how they do it. When I was in India, now I've eaten things with my hands before, a sandwich. You know, you don't cut a sandwich with a fork, do you? I mean, that's kind of odd, or a candy bar like Costanza, you know, like cut that up. And it's like, no, you don't do that. <laughs> They eat everything with their hands. Curry, which is really like this soupy type substance. I don't like my hands to be dirty. They took a handful of rice and just stuck their whole hand in this curry. And I'm looking at them like, where's the forks? And they looked at me like, what's a fork? Don't you like curry? It's just how they did it. The Widmer family was tough for me to get used to eating around the table. My parents raised me wrong. They raised me having steaks well done. I mean, why don't you just tear off the bottom of your shoe and eat it? That's what you have there. But that's how I did it when we got married 20 years ago. And I showed up at the table, and all of a sudden, I see this red blood all over plates, and I'm like... What are you, cannibals? What's going on? It's disgusting. Now, by the way, we've met in the middle. I'm a medium guy, as God intended steaks to be eaten. And another thing shocked me. Every, no, if a steak is good, it doesn't need any A1 or anything like that. If you see me eating A1 with a steak, it means this is not a good steak. Well, another thing that just surprised me. The first dinner we went to at Greg and Marcy's. Now, Marcy has good German stock. She was a Hockemeyer. Just say it like, Hockemeyer. And the first dinner, Marcy's a wonderful cook. And she gets up from the table at dinner and says, I forgot the jelly. And I'm looking just bone puzzled, thinking, it's not breakfast. Jelly? Dinner? Something is amiss. Every dinner. I've ever had to win this jelly on the table because that is an every meal thing with the bread and I'm looking in complete confusion. That's not confusion. That's not how we did things. That was a breakfast thing and we only got the Smucker's grape jelly and we always saved the last biscuit to cover it in butter and eat it with jelly or my grandma ate it with sorghum. And that's just the way you do it. That's what jelly's for. And then you put it in the cupboard for the next day, you know, or the fridge for the next day. And the pass around thing, that got me. We came from a family that obviously did not treat food in the proper way. We just dug in. And we're sitting at dinner, and I filled my plate. I'm like reaching over and like, and I'm like this. And all of a sudden, Jenny's like nudging me, passing me something. And I'm like, what? It's like passive. I'm like, I'm trying to eat. And I look and I'm like, took another bite. Then there's something. That, I'm like, would you leave me alone so I could eat? And 
she just kept passing, and I found out that's how you do things. Now, that's proper. That's manners. You pass everything around until everybody had something. Then you pray. Then you eat together. It's just how it's done. And now I've become a passer. What I was so dogmatic about, I didn't realize that there was another way to do it that was just as right as mine was. You know, we do the same thing to God right here in the church. We've made a doctrine out of methodology and preference and tradition and our own comfort level. Uh oh, is right. Let me ask you this what's the proper way to worship? Spirit and truth. There you go. What about raising hands? Is that proper? Absolutely. But is the one that chooses to raise their hands any more spiritual than the one that doesn't worship that way? What about the one that stands? Do they love Jesus more than the one that chooses to sit and be reflective in worship? Hmm. I don't necessarily think so either. What about dancing? I mean... A little excessive, isn't it? No. But is the person that chooses not to dance or doesn't do that, are they any less worshipful than the person that is just cutting a rug and getting down to business? I used to go to this church in Nashville on Tuesday night, and they always started with the obligatory dance song. I'm not a dancer by nature. It doesn't mean I haven't ever done it. But it always made me uncomfortable because I felt like it was time for the forced dance song. And people were looking at me like, why aren't you jumping? Like, all, Well, I'm not 20 like you are, first of all. <laughs> you ever seen somebody run in church? Oh, yeah. I mean, Jesus! <laughs> what? dignified, mind you, and judge that person as what is wrong with them. And I've also ran. <laughs> is one more worshipful than the other? What about this one? What about the flag wavers? You remember those? I haven't seen them in a while. We have people over here, it was like the largest flags in <laughs> then they get this <laughs> I was scared to sit anywhere close to them <laughs> is it proper you bet it is I'm still recovering from the run <laughs> so are you <laughs> I've judged people doing that and thought, it's a little, a little excessive. Is that really necessary? While tears were streaming down their face, pouring their love upon Jesus. <sighs> what about when we pray? Now this is interesting because it kind of goes against how I was raised in my subconscious, if that makes sense. Prayer. Is a loud prayer more spiritual than a quiet one? Does God hear a loud prayer more than he hears a whisper? What about posture? Does God receive a prayer on my knees? Jesus. More than he receives one with me standing or laying? I don't think so. <laughs> what about those people that actually pray with their eyes open? Can you believe it? <laughs> you know, when the preacher says everyone bow their heads and close their eyes, no one looking around and it's always that one person. <laughs> Is 
my eyes closed praying? See, I, that was hard for me to overcome because I felt like that's the proper way that Jesus hears you. I can't look around, you know, sometimes. <laughs> Just one eye up, you know? Is it more spiritual or proper than the one who chooses to pray with their eyes open? I'll tell you what broke me out of that when I started praying while I was driving. <laughs> Don't close your eyes. It actually was a training process to get me to stop. It. Like, you know what? I think I'm going to go, Lord, are you okay with my eyes open? If not, then Jesus take the will. You know? <laughs> Let me ask you this. What do you do? What is the correct response when the glory of the Lord comes upon you? about crying? Is it a correct response? My dad, I used to think, you big cry baby. <laughs> he felt one goosebump of the Holy Spirit and tears just started streaming down his face. That was hard for me as a kid because I was not a cry guy. I tried to cry because I felt like that's what you're supposed to do when God comes. Now, <laughs> waterworks. <laughs> It's proper. What about laughing? Man, there's nothing like holy laughter. Oh, yeah. It's awesome when just the presence of the Lord is there and you start belly laughing in the spirit and can't stop. What about this one? I actually had a conversation, <laughs> multiple conversations about this this week. What about, you know, being slain in the spirit? Is that proper when you get prayed for? When you feel the glory of the Lord? Is the person that falls down while you pray for them receiving any more of the Lord than those that stand still and have no emotional response whatsoever? I struggled with that. When I went to Christ for the Nations back in, gosh, it's been a long time ago. This guy wanted to pray for every person, every student. Lined us up on stage. Boom, fall down. 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 Praise for me. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm a sinner. <laughs> Is it a pro? Absolutely. Is it necessary? No. Oftentimes, though, we fall in love with the methodology. And sometimes I get prayed for that I feel like the person's praying for me is disappointed if I don't fall down on the ground. It's a mistake when we fall in love with the methodology more than we fall in love with the manifesto. Just leave the results in his hands. You don't even have to, I mean, you can touch me. I don't care. Just follow the Lord, you know, but leave the response up to God. What about this one? <laughs> what about action? What if when the glory of the Lord comes upon you, you get active? It makes you do something. Back to the falling down on the ground, I can tell you something. God's a lot more concerned with what you do when you get up. Biblically, when the glory of the Lord came upon Samson, all of a sudden, hurrah, and he just puts his hands on these pillars, and he pushes the building in. How many times in the scripture do we see the glory of the Lord coming upon somebody, and all of a sudden, they just get active for the Spirit of God, and they do something for the kingdom? Is that appropriate response? Absolutely. What about laying on your face? Absolutely. There was times that the glory of the Lord was so strong that the priests could not minister. Wow. Open your Bibles to John chapter 12. And I want us to talk about this because I feel like it's important. Because I can tell you in this church where we are right now, the glory of the Lord is being manifested. The glory of the Lord is showing up in this place. And you know what I want you to run away today with? You're free. Amen. And there's no restrictions or expectations on you in any way. You know God has uniquely designed every person here. He's uniquely gifted and given you a personality. 
Do you remember the guy that used to come to church? She used to sit right here, Jerry Robinson. That was the dancingest guy I've ever seen in my life. He had soul. I always thought, man, I really want to worship like that. I never quite looked like Jerry. Looked like I had some physical impairments when I tried it. Six days before the Passover, John chapter 12, verse 1. Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there, and Martha served. <clears throat> hmm. Interesting. Martha's serving. Was that worship? You know, Mary gets all the credit in this story, as we'll get to in a minute. Martha was no less worshiping Jesus than Mary was. The only difference was everybody was comfortable with what Martha was doing. I'm hungry, Martha. Bring me some bacon. Well, they're kosher. They didn't have it. Thank God for the vision Peter had when he said, Rise, kill, and eat. I've called it clean. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. But Martha was worshiping Jesus by serving. And Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. I think Lazarus was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing. He had just been risen from the dead the chapter before. And he was just sitting and soaking in the presence of God. Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm just going to lay up against you and enjoy your presence. You know, let's give the guy a break, okay? He just went through quite an ordeal. He's just enjoying the presence of God. Martha was worshiping through her service. Lazarus was worshiping through his fellowship. And now Mary took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with their hair. Her hair, not theirs. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Oh, man, what a lavish act of worship. What a beautiful act. She comes in. Now, you remember the chapter before. She would not speak to Jesus. <clears throat> when Jesus comes into town, she stayed in the house until Martha went and fetched her. She comes out, and that's where Jesus weeps. She's like, where were you? And you know, she's angry. And now she's at this place of lavish worship in this beautiful act of pouring oil on the feet of Jesus and taking her hair. I wonder how long that took to get out. I don't think she even tried to wash it out. <laughs> Just leave that fragrance on there the rest of my life. You know, and she's washing the feet of the Savior. What a beautiful act of worship. But let me ask you a question. How come we've never thought... Man, what a beautiful act of worship that Martha was doing by serving Jesus. What a beautiful act of worship that Lazarus was doing by enjoying the presence and leaning up against Jesus. But we take one, and we're like, well, that one was really worshiping. And we even write songs. One of my favorite ones, the C.C. Wanin song. <laughs> you don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster box. It's this beautiful thing. But I want to suggest to you today, that all three of them were worshiping in different postures. One was no necessarily greater than the other. But the only distinction was Mary's act was the only one that made everybody else uncomfortable. So much so that Judas, and it goes on to tell us, the one that was going to betray Jesus, says, What is this? This is wasteful. This is ridiculous. This is not how it's properly done. Interesting enough that no one said, Martha, good grief, you don't worship Jesus that way. <coughs> Lazarus, you soaker in his presence, you lazy bum, that's not how you worship. 
But Mary's act was offensive to him. He goes on to tell us he was robbing money, you know, not that he was necessarily concerned with the poor. And Jesus says this, leave her alone. Leave her be so that she can keep it for the day of my burial for the poor you'll always have with you. But you don't always have me. It was her point of faith. It was Mary's expression. It was her moment. It was her worship. <laughs> it's just the lack of acceptance that everybody else had on it. And the real truth is not... Why are they doing that? Why are they dancing? Why are they screaming? Why are they yelling? Why are they raising their hands? Why are they opening their box like that? That's not the way it's done. It's embarrassing. The real question is, why aren't we? Each expression will look differently because each creature is different and whoever it was that said it back here, we need to learn how to worship him in spirit and in truth, and allow that expression to come from you. And not some expected form that everybody else is doing that I have to adhere to. That's not unique. God's a creative God that has created each of us unique. And all of a sudden, we're trying to take our uniqueness and bring us to a place where we're conformed to what everybody else is doing and everybody else looks like. Let me tell you what that does. It robs Jesus of the praise that he's desiring from you. I'm going to say it again. It robs Jesus of what he's desiring from you. What is the oil that he's given you? True worship is not confined to a methodology. It's just you. And the problem is we live in such a Judas culture that is so judgmental of every person's expression to Jesus that the way we conduct ourselves, we leave a lot of people in fear so much so that they will never open their boxes. Amen. We're slamming the lid shut on what other people are trying to do through our own judgmentalism. Or we are seeking to worship Jesus in spirit and truth but we're slamming the lid shut on our box out of fear of what everybody else is going to think. Because it's different. Jesus is deprived of creative and unique praise. And I've been guilty. And I apologize. Let me tell you something. You're off the hook. You know what? I have zero expectation of what you do. There's no, this is how we do things here. Fit in that box. That's not God. That's human tradition trying to confine and pigeonhole the spirit of God. And I don't think God likes that. Because he created you uniquely. If you're a server like Martha then serve in your worship. And if you don't dance like somebody else, maybe that's not your unique expression to God. Or if you're just soaking in the presence of God, oh, like Lazarus. But it's those lavish, what we consider over the top, it's like, I wish you could do that. Man, take the lid off that box and give God what he desires from you. Have you ever felt pressure to conform to what everybody else is doing? I mean, heck, I've done it. Everybody lift your hands. You know, we're in worship. Everybody just raise your hands. And there's nothing wrong with raising our hands. Nothing wrong with that. But it kind of always bothered me because it's like saying, let's all do the same thing and express to God in the same manner when we're all completely unique and different. It doesn't make sense. All right, guys, and that's why I used to hate these motion songs. Don't, gosh. Oh, I hate them so bad. You have time. We're supposed to turn, you know, or I walk 
by faith. I, I don't want to do emotion. This is, I mean, that's fine. If that's your thing, that's cool. But it's like saying, here's what we're all going to do. No, you be you. You be you. I've been in worship services where the worship leader, I'm so thankful that our worship leaders don't do this. And I've heard this comment enough times that it makes me want to vomit. They'll stop and say, guys, you're not worshiping. And I'm thinking to myself, how dare you confine my worship to Jesus to some outside action that you see? You don't know what's going on in my heart. You have no clue the genuine authenticity. I can be sitting like this and the Holy Spirit can be all over me. You're not worshiping. I can tell by your eyes you don't love Jesus. <laughs> Why are we running people out? Because when they don't fit into the box that we create for them to fit in, oh, I guess I'll go somewhere else. People at their core have got to be themselves. And I'm not saying live in a comfort zone. God wants us to expand beyond that at times, but at your core, he created you that way. There's three kinds of people I want to talk about. Those that won't open their own box. Say that with me. Those that won't open their own box. Have you ever been afraid of an expression because of what everybody else will think? I have. We all have. I've been in some places that I have seen some extravagant, unique expressions of worship. I remember the first time I went out to Bethel at Reading. Their stage looked like a three-ring circus. You know, after all, you only have instruments on the stage, and you have this, and this is what this guitar does. This is your part. We all have parts. Not them. They had a guy over here on this side of the stage during worship that was painting during worship. I'm like, that's not worship. Do this. That's worship. Then it had what? She had a tutu on. It looked like a ballerina just... <laughs> and I'm like, what is that? It was her unique expression of worship to Jesus, and it was gorgeous. Why do we have such a conformed way that we worship Jesus? Man, it's a struggle. And what it does, it leaves people in a box that they're afraid to open it because there's such a Judas culture out there that will say, don't do that here. <laughs> Those are words of a dying church. That's not how we do things here. Guess what I don't have permission to do? I don't have permission to hold you and tie you down on what God's created you to be. Right. <laughs> One of the big questions that I get as pastor, people come in, they have the entry interview. You know, it's like, what's your vision? How can I help you fulfill your vision? You're the man of God. You're the pastor. Tell me what to do. And I always shock people because I always respond with this. You're my vision. What has God created you to be? Because my job is for you to be your created purpose and pull that out of you because that's where freedom comes to you. That's where wholeness comes to you. And that's where God gets maximum praise when you're functioning in your God-created design, not in what I want you to do. And God's a God that gives us freedom. And there's people that live with their lids shut and Jesus is deprived of this creative praise and creative worship because we're wanting them to do what we do. Here's your expected response. Here's what we do and here's what you do. I don't have a right to tell you that. Here's another thing. Say those that won't open their own box. <coughs> here's the second kind. Those that won't allow others to be themselves 
and open their boxes. I went through all that food thing, not just to be funny, although I'm pretty funny. I'm, I'm a lot. I'm the guy that laughs at my jokes more than anybody else because obviously I'm hysterical. And, but with that stuff, my way is not the right way. <clears throat> Man, that's hard because we really think that it is. You know, you can go a different way to Draftonville, and it's not necessarily wrong. I'm just going to go on 68 and go right down there. Sure. You can cut across High School Road, cut on 641. You can go over by the uh, Brinesburg Church of Christ and cut down 641 by the bus garage. I don't know why, but you could. <laughs> There's a lot of different ways. And what I desire here at Christian Fellowship is for us to create a culture that not only doesn't judge, but rather encourages people. You open up you and pour it on the feet of Jesus without fear of repercussion. I had a unique experience one time in South Africa on one of my trips there. Out of all the places in the world I've been, I think I've been to South Africa the most. I think I've been nine times. And some would call this a success, but others would define it as complete failure, and I think that's where I fit in. I went to one church, South Africa, was the, of course there's a huge white population in South Africa, but in this church I was the only white guy there. And I walked into this church, and these missionaries had dressed up all of these Africans, and they're in suits and ties, they're in their dresses with their hats, and I walk in, and they're singing English hymns, which I like hymns. There's nothing wrong with that. It looked like a Pentecostal church service from the 1940s, which is fine. Don't have anything against that. But they were a product of what others expected and made them to be. I know that that's not who they were. And then the next night, we went to a service out in the bush. Half the people didn't even have clothes on. And my first thought is, well, this is inappropriate. How immodest. The other half of them wore their traditional African stuff. Some of those people had never even seen a white man, right in the heart of the bush, man. And their worship service went for seven hours. I didn't understand a word of it. But the whole time, there was this one guy, he's he just doing these weird kicks and they're all dancing, you know. And I'm looking like what is this? But it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. Why? Because the missionaries that reached them realized my job is not to make them Americanize. My job is to let Jesus be reflected in this culture and to get that praise. Let me tell you something. In the Word, when it says at the end, when there's every tribe and every nation around the throne giving Him praise, we're not all going to be singing English, wearing suits and ties, all dressed the same. There's going to be people from every tribe, every nation. There's going to be those dancing. There's going to be those not dressed like you. There's going to be people all over the place that are lavishly pouring their oil on the feet of Jesus. And guess what? They're not going to care what you think. Let's start doing that. And let's stop expecting people to respond in the way that we're comfortable. And let's let that unique, creative person on the inside of them begin to give Jesus the praise that he's due. That's the problem with church culture in America. We have fallen in love with a methodology, and it's wrong. It is wrong. It is wrong. It is wrong, it is wrong, it is wrong. Methods will always change. And it confines people and it robs Jesus. There's those that won't open their own box out of fear. There's those that keep other people's boxes shut out of judgmentalism. And then there's those that stay Jesus-focused. Instead of being methodology oriented. <laughs> the expression and the manifestation are not as important as who it is unto. Is 
this speaking to you? We have a tendency to fall in love with that manifestation. And Jesus doesn't care. He just wants to come. It's not about the box. It's about him. It would have been wrong if everybody, okay, this is the, uh, let me get some alabaster. Let's all pour oil. That was her expression. That was her act of worship. Jesus wasn't saying, okay, from now on, guys, here's proper worship. Get you some alabaster. Grow your hair out. Wash my feet. That's how we worship. No, he was saying, leave her alone. This is her expression, and to me, it's beautiful. It wasn't a condemnation of Lazarus soaking in the presence. It wasn't a condemnation of Martha saying, Martha, you're not worshiping. No. It was an appreciation. Leave her alone. And I want to get back to where we started in this church. There is no right way. There's just you and your unique God-given design. And God wants you to function in that and to give him praise through it. Man, there's freedom in that. There is freedom in that. One of the greatest truths that I've ever learned, and it's not prideful or arrogant in any way, is to embrace me and say, God made me this way. And guess what? I don't need your permission to be me. And you don't need my permission to be you. When you appreciate the design that God gave you and start to operate and function in that we got some extravagant worshipers in this church man it's gorgeous you got Brianna sometimes she dances all over that stage you got Damien who worships from his toes this morning he got on his knees and was worshiping does that mean all of us need to be on our knees this is the correct posture no it was his expression and it's gorgeous but I also see people that they just sit like this with their eyes closed. Guess what? I appreciate that expression to Jesus. And I don't expect for you to be me. You get to be you. Let's leave the manifestations and the results to Jesus. If you pray for me, don't try to push me down. Amen. <laughs> Is anybody else sick of that? I mean, that's fine. That could be a manifestation from the Lord, but let's leave it up to Him. It's not an expected response. And if I don't do that, then God's not moving in it. That's stupid. Everybody's different. Leave the manifestations up to Jesus and embrace your design. And what you better do is open the box and pour it on the feet of Jesus. If it's serving, if it's soaking, if it's washing, it doesn't matter. Stay Jesus focused. It's not about the box. Isn't that free that you have no expectations other than to be you and creatively give that to God? Man, it's awesome. It's my praise and nobody can take it from me. Guess what? At that throne room, I'm going to give him a unique praise that nobody else has given him. It's a richy praise. And that's what he wants. He doesn't want me to give a Chris Harwood praise. That's Chris's job. That's his job. Be free. And let the Holy Spirit come. Jesus, we welcome you in this place. And as pastor of this church, I want to publicly make aware that you are moving, Lord. I see a hunger in this place that I haven't seen in a long time. Maybe never. It's unique. Lord, and we take the lid off of the box today and we say, come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. And what we vow to give you is what you created in us to be to give you. No expectations. The lid off the box. 
we focus on you and we pour it on the feet of Jesus. Lord, we're going to let others pour their praise too. And we're not going to try to confine them. That's just as wrong. When somebody lavishly pours and we say, oh, that's not appropriate. God, we have got to allow others to have their freedom of expression without feeling the intense desire to conform to what they're doing. That's not how you designed us to be, Lord. What a freeing word you've given us, Jesus. Freedom to be us and to give it to you. Thank you. Stand if you want to sit, sit. If you want to lay, lay. If you want to come forward, come forward. But we're going to worship this morning. And I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. As we worship, take the lid off of your box. It might not ever be an expression that's been seen before. If there's something in you you've always desired to do, if it's run, then you run. If it's scream, then you scream. If it's to sit quietly, you sit quietly. If it's to dance, you dance. If it's to lay, you lay. You come forward and open your box and let's focus on Jesus Christ and begin to lavishly worship Him this morning. And there's no expectations of how you do that. Go ahead, guys. Breaking. 